So imagine everyone please stand, Philippians chapter 1. You see in your handout, we just have one verse of scripture. Amen. And I forgot to put there, it's just the eighth portion. Amen. So we don't have much this morning, but we have enough for this hour. Amen. 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 Please allow me to read to you exactly what your uh, text ought to read as you read within the King James Version. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 27. Should read, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. I like the way it is also written in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, where it instructs us this statement. Just one thing. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. So that's what we will be talking about today. You know, for the last two weeks, we have been talking about what in the world is Christianity, right? And, and I've been trying to answer the question, what is Christianity, from the standpoint that Christianity is honoring the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of your life. And then last week we talked about Christianity is desiring Christ. And so this week, what is Christianity? But Christianity is living a life, as our text has stated, in a manner that is worthy of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I run into so often is this idea that Christianity is not true. And one of the reasons that they that people claim that Christianity is not true is not because of what Jesus did. Be, because they believe if that was true, then something else would, would be true that they don't see. Or they, they say that Christianity is not true. All you have to do is just look at those who claim to be Christian. See, this, this is where the waters get muddy. The question I want to ask, are you a Christian this morning? I want that to ponder in your mind. I haven't lost my train of thought. I got a lot to say. A little time to say it. But I want that to ponder in your mind. I'm asking you the question. Now some of you might be saying, well, I've been here since we started 41 years ago. Mm-hmm. Are you a Christian? Here's how I can push back and challenge. Because it doesn't matter the tenure that you may have at a church. It does, it does not matter if you were baptized as a child or baptized as an adult. Are you a Christian? According to the scriptures. And when I ask, are you a Christian according to the scriptures, I'm, I'm going to part all of the scripture texts and just focus in on this one thought and asking you this question. Because remember, I said I'm not fixated on, on the doctrine of who Christ is that we must believe in order to be a Christian. That's chapter two. We'll get there. But really, in chapter number one, I've been talking about the practice of those who call themselves Christian. Here our text states to us clearly. Paul said, let your conversation or your life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Or as I stated in the other translation, live your life in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. That's what Christianity is. It is one who lives their life that's worthy of the gospel itself. So what in the world 
am I talking about? I want to look at it from this standpoint as we move along in the scripture this morning. And then next week we'll, we will exegete or walk through the rest of, rest of these texts on next week. But for this week, what is Christianity but a life that is lived that is worthy of the gospel? Therefore, if one is going to live their life worthy of the gospel, they're going to have to live their life quorum deo. Now, now what is the word quorum deo? That, that, that sounds unfamiliar because that's a Latin phrase that was taken from the time during the Reformation to say that we live before the very presence of God. So it's just a big, fancy word in Latin that says we live before the presence of God. Yeah. Is that how you live on a daily basis? Say lie. Do you live your life daily before the presence of God? And I'm talking about that in what, what it ought to be meant and understood. You see, some folks have this Christianity that they will live a, a certain way. They'll talk a certain way when the pastor comes around. Then, then when the pastor leaves the presence, it's turn up time. And, and, and then we'll, we'll be sipping red cups and, and singing all sorts of songs. I don't know if y'all family is much like my family, but they have a time for the old folks and for the Christians. And at a certain time, they let the old folks and the Christians know that it's really time for y'all to leave. We, we, we get the hit, we get the point, and okay, now we thank y'all for coming. But there's another party after that. And, and, and so many times, those who stay for the after party, they profess to be Christians. And so when they're out of the presence of, 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 of certain people, they, live a, they, they, they will live their life in a totally different way. But do you understand that you never leave the presence of God? That ought to be the measuring stick by which you live your life. You ought to be living your life quorum deo, in the very presence of God. You see, this is why I, I seek not to lie. I seek to be faithful as a husband. I seek to do my best as a father. Why? Because I recognize I am daily living every single moment in his presence. Amen. Then therefore, I don't have to give an account to all of you. I have to give an account to him. Yes. Therefore, my life is governed and structured in a particular way. And so I hope that that's your passion this morning, that you desire to live Cornell. And I want to show you that in the scriptures. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. And in Exodus chapter 33. We, we find a familiar text, if you will. Because here in Exodus is when Moses yeah. goes up into the mountain. Yeah. He gets the Ten Commandments, if you will. And he comes down, and it's a party going on down there. Y'all remember that? Y'all yeah. remember Moses coming down the mountain? And Moses was like, man, what is that noise that I hear? Well, that's chapter 32. And so you see that scene. This is what's going on. Moses comes down and he, he sees them partying and worshiping and having their orgy and, worship and, and their idolatry. And he slams down the very commandments that God has just written with his own finger and destroys the tablet. And so then here in, in chapter 33, beginning at verse number 12, 
Moses is about to go up again, but, but I want you to see the conversation. I want, you, I want you to grab a hold of the conversation because I want you to have the same heart and mindset that Moses had. Are you there with me? Exodus 33, chapter, uh, chapter 33, verse 12. Wow. Notice Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in thy sight. And he said, that now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, God said, my presence will go with thee. I will give thee rest. Look at verse 16. For within shall it be known where that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of this earth. Skip down to verse 18. That's where I really want to get to. And then the conversation ends like this. Moses saying, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Mo Moses is willing to do what God has told him to do. Moses is willing to go and lead these stiff-necked, rebellious people. He is willing to do whatever God has instructed him. But he said, before God, I do this. Show me your glory. Show me your presence. If your presence is not going to go with us, God, I don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And your people need you. Do you have that heart? When, when you get up tomorrow morning, when you ask God to show him your glory, because you realize that you are living Coram Deo. You realize that you are, are, are living a life in his presence. That's your heart, mind, and soul. So Corandeo, this is what this statement means. It means that we live in the very presence of God. And we live in his presence all of our day. Think about this. Would you want to live not in his presence when you fall unconscious at night? But would you like his presence to lead the same way when you choose to do your thing? You don't want the presence of some people. Well, here's a presence that you cannot escape. Amen. Coram Deo is living in the very presence of God. But Coram Deo is also living under the authority of God. All right. Here's why we do what it is that we do. Because we live under his authority. Somebody might ask, well, why do you believe the way that you believe? Because I am under authority of God that he has said, believe in his son whom he has sent. That's why we believe in him. We believe in trust. He says, believe, believe in him who he has sent, who he has died for your sins, and he who has rose again from the dead. Take that into comparison with every other religion. Take that into comparison with every other belief system. This is the only one who says, believe in him who has died and rose again from the dead. We do not live under the authority of one who said that you can die and you can come back again in another life in another state. That ought to be dangerous. Because those, those, those who believe that system, they believe in karma. I know none of y'all here believe in karma. But those who believe that, they believe in karma. So what does that mean? What goes around comes around. So then, if you was a knucklehead in this life, do you really want to die and come back? <laughs> As a worse off knucklehead than when you went in? Think about that. This system in which we believe in, according to the authority of God's word, every man must die and then the judgment. Amen. 
For those who are unbelievers, you'll be judged at the great white throne of judgment. There, your, your, your sins will be accounted for, and you will spend eternity in hell. But for all of us who believe, yeah. we go to the beamer seat of Christ. But it is there that we have to take an account for that which we have done. But oh glory, here's the good news. That which we have done has been, has been taken to Calvary Cross. It's been nailed right there and our slates have been wiped clean. Therefore the account that we have to answer for is a clean slate because of what Christ did. It is because of that we have eternal life. It is because of that we have reconciliation with God. It is that, and because of that, we are not enemies, but we are sons and daughters. And so then at the beam of seat of Christ, we will stand there. That's where we will receive our crowns. And then according, according to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we take our crowns before the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne and we bring them crowns and we lay them before his feet and we say, worthy is the Lamb who he died for our sins. Worthy is he. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go before that throne and have nothing to lay at my king's feet. Living Coram Dale is to live in his very presence, in the presence of God. It means to live under the authority of God. And then it means also to live, to, to, to live a life in the honor and glory of God. Yeah. Now, now what does this mean? We live a life that's honoring and, gl and glorifying to God. We can sum that up by saying by living the way Christ lived. We want to live in a way that's pleasing and that's satisfying unto him. You know, the old saying goes, if, if your last name was Williams or Jones, and, and somebody saw you uh, not living or, or, or acting in the same manner and character of Daddy Jones or Daddy Williams, they would say, you acting out your character. You're not acting like a Jones or you're not acting like a Williams. Same for us as Christians. We ought to be living a life that people ought to see the way that we live, which is a life worthy of the gospel. People ought to see the way that we live, and they ought to say, you acting just like your daddy. Yeah. Right. You loving just like your daddy. You showing mercy just like your daddy yeah. would show mercy. You are kind and compassionate just like your daddy. That's living a life to the honor and to the glory of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, and all that you do, do it to the honor and glory of God. Every single thing, no matter what. And this is why I often say to people, I do not walk on eggshells within my life. I just live to his honor and for his glory. And then if I fall short, if I miss the mark, then the Bible says that I can, I can go to him. And if I ask for forgiveness, he will give it to me. And he will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Yes. That, that's what the Bible says. First yes. John chapter 1. We all know this. Yes. And some people might try to challenge you. But that's good. Because keep reading First John. Go to chapter 2, where it says in, in verse number 1, My little children. Sin not. That's the command. Oh, watch grace and mercy come right in. He says, but if you do, you have an advocate yeah. with the Father, yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ, the righteous. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. Yeah. I, I seek to live to his honor and glory in absolutely everything that I do. So I seek to sin not, but if I do, beloved, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. The righteous. Thank you, Lord. So, beloved, what is a life that's lived worthy of the gospel? Is one that is lived quorum deo in the very presence of God and the authority of God and to the honor and glory of God. But it's also a life that is lived by the power of the Spirit of God. Understand this: Christianity is not a morality change. Christianity does not mean you simply do better in life. 
That's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity means that you live by the power of the Spirit. And so, beloved, what does that look like? What does that mean? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. There again, Ephesians chapter 5, one of those well-read scriptures. I want you to look at verse number 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, where Paul said, Don't be drunk with wine that's under the control of another substance, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be, be filled, be under the authority of, be led by. When, you, when something is filling you, it's moving you in a particular direction. Amen. So when one lives in the power of the Spirit, he walks in the wisdom of God. Where do I get that from? Verse 15. Verse 15 said, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Beloved, we have to understand exactly what that text is telling us. Where it tells us that we are to not walk circumspectly. That's not how we ought to walk. But we ought to walk in such a manner that we are walking in the wisdom and the authority of God. We ought to understand the very wisdom that resides deep down in each and every one of us. The wisdom of God makes make, Make the things of this earth foolish. Amen. Amen. You say, well, where am I getting all these thoughts from? Now, for this one, if you show up in Bible study at 5.30 on Wednesday, you will get it fleshed out. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, really, in my translation, it says, what was God thinking about to use the foolish things of this world? Except that he was, in, except that he was intensely confusing those that are wise in this world. That's what guys do. That's why God will take the weak things of this world and confuse the wise. That's why God will take the weak things of this world and show forth His power in them. God will take the weak and the foolish and the ignorant of this world and use them in such a mighty way that the world has a witness to say that was not nothing. But God. So when you live by the power of the Spirit, you walk in the wisdom of God, like verse, six, verse 15 tells us to do. But also, you redeem every single day. Listen, you want to take this day for the glory of God. No matter what it is you do after we leave here, you ought to be trying to redeem in this day for His honor and for His glory. You might say, I'm just going to the local grocery store, doing unto the glory and honor of God. If I had time today, I would give me a nap to his glory and to his honor. That way when I'm refreshed, I can be free to go forth and do what it is he has called for me to do. And everything you do, redeem that to the glory and to the honor of God. That's why verse 16 says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Every single day, it has its place. And God has a purpose in that place for you. There is never not a day that God is desiring to use you for his glory and for his honor. Never not a day. Never not a moment. Regardless of what it is that you're doing or where you are at. On your job, you ought to be doing it to the glory and honor to, of God and redeeming that particular time, being a witness and a light to everybody on your job. No matter where you go, the entirety of the Christian life can be summed up in that. We redeem the time because the days are evil. All right. And then if we're going to live in the power of the Spirit, we also then, according to Verse number 17. We also want to seek out the will of God. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You have to seek out that will. The Bible says that God said that if you seek me, you will find me. He said if you, if you knock, he'll open. 
He, he says, come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden. And he says, come on, I'll give you rest. Seek his will. There is a specific will that he has for each and every one of us. Somebody missed this. Some people missed this from the promise of God in, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. When God speaks to them, to them and says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Expected end is a future and hope in him. Expected end means he had a purpose for all of them in Israel and all of us who come under the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He has a expected end for each and every one of us. Seek the will of God. Redeem every single day and walk in his wisdom. That's, walk, that's living in the power of the spirit. And then lastly, living a life worthy of the gospel is not just living quorum day or walk in the power of the spirit, but it's living a sacrificial life. If you read Luke chapter 9, he gives you those three ways to live that out before him. Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, he says, follow me. He says, come and follow me. Lay everything aside, that way we put all of our trust in him. Therefore, we have to deny ourselves. Because you might be following Jesus and find yourself in a jam in life, and you believe that, you believe that your intellect might get you out of this jam. Or you might come to the thought process to say, well, all I got to do is give them my plastic card and we're going to work all this out. There's something that your name and your plastic can't get you out of. But it is only by the grace and mercy of God. It is only because God has turned the heart of somebody and gave you favor. That's living a life that's worthy of the gospel. When you deny yourself and you put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You pick up your cross and follow him. He has a purpose for you. There's a cross for you. And there's a cross for me. Will you pick up that cross and follow him? Because that's what Christianity is. Christianity is not about per se. Coming to church on Sunday morning. That's good. But that's where we edify one another. That's where we lift one another up. As the Bible says, we encourage one another to love and good works. So we need this fellowship so we can follow and obey those commands. But that's not what it's all about. It's all about living in his very presence. It's all about living by the power of his spirit. Not by our might, but by his spirit, says the Lord. And for us to live a life that's sacrificial in every single aspect. So are you living that type of life? Since your confession of faith, is this the life that you are living? Since you said that you believe, is, is this how the Spirit of God has transformed your life? That this is the life that you are living? If your life is not worthy of this gospel, then that means you are not saved. Again, even if you've been sitting here for years, even if you grew up in a household where mama and daddy were Christians, even if you, you've grown up and it's all because of grandma that you're saved, but if you are not living a life worthy of the gospel, then you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. You need to come humbly before God and ask God by the power of his spirit to save you, to regenerate your soul that you might be able to live for him. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, so often your church is simply characterized not by him who has died, but those who live. Yes, Lord. Okay, Lord, if, if, if therefore that is how your church will be judged, 
and lead us that we might live a life that's worthy of the gospel so that every aspect of our life will point back to that which Christ did on Calvary's cross. We are who we are because Christ died and rose again. That is what we believe to the core of our heart. And dear God, as Paul said, without that, we live in vain. So Father, I pray the Lord that you would touch the heart of everyone who is here today. First and foremost, dear Father God, for they are not living a life that's worthy of the gospel. So they will come forth, dear God. And they will even say, what must I do to be saved? Well, they will say, Lord, I, I need to rededicate my life unto you because I have not been living in that way. Lord, we will trust your spirit to do that work. And Father, if there's any of the Father God who are here and does not have a church home, and they are looking for a place to worship and to grow and be a disciple, Father, I ask pray that you touch their hearts as well. And again, that is a work of the spirit. It is not a work that we can do. It is a work that we must put it in your hands, say God. So Father God, I thank you. By the power of your spirit, may we be a church that